welcome to today's course. Today I'm going to talk mostly about failure detectors. So this is one of the most important inventions to make the algorithm simple. So I started yesterday, sorry yesterday, last week, but uh, I'll give you again intuition. So the idea is we want to make algorithms for the internet, for partially synchronous systems, and the second point is that's not easy, that's hard, so everything we can do to simplify that is good. So in the olden days, people in every algorithm they published, they would again and again and again model the detection of failures over and over again. And that was made the algorithm was very complicated. So around 1990, failure detectors was a concept was invented, and this makes the algorithms much simpler, as you will see. So all the timing assumptions on failures, on round trip times, heartbeats, uh, where you send repeated messages, is inside the failure detector. So it's like a black box, it's an abstraction, it encapsulates the timing. And it gives you messages, which are called suspicions. And they might be right, and they might be wrong, these suspicions, okay? So here is a slide that summarizes the whole thing. So we have this yellow box here, which is failure detector P. So this is called a perfect failure detector. And this one will give you messages. It's coming out. So it's only indications coming out. And it's crash messages. PI has crashed. It tells you node P1 has crashed. Failure detector P is the perfect failure detector. So P stands for perfect. It never makes mistakes. When it tells you a node crash, you know it's guaranteed correct. And this is the failure detector you get when you have a synchronous system. Okay? Then you can implement P. Never makes mistakes. But that's not the one you get on the internet. On the internet, you get this one. This is eventually P. Okay? So this little diamond symbol means eventually it's coming from temporal logic. So I'm not going to give you a course on temporal logic, but you can look up temporal logic. It's a logic which lets you reason about things that happen in time, over time, in time steps. So eventually means that it will become true in some future finite time. So what that means is that this failure detector is eventually perfect. That means sometime in the future, it will be perfect. But right now, it's probably not perfect. So this is the kind of thing you get in a partially synchronous system. So this one gives you two kinds of messages. Not just crash. It either suspects a node. It says, I think P2 has crashed. Or it says, no, 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 restore P2. I was wrong. Actually, P2 is fine. So P2 can be either suspected, but I can also retract. I can say, it's okay. P2, I think, is okay again. So this one will suspect nodes and restore nodes, and it can make mistakes. It can falsely suspect anytime. Just fall, say, P3 has crashed, I think, and then later on says, no, I was wrong. Didn't crash. And the algorithm you don't really know whether it's making a mistake or not. Huh? All you know is that eventually it stops making mistakes. That means after some finite time, it does not make mistakes anymore. But in the beginning, it can make arbitrary mistakes. So this is what you get on the internet. You get this thing that can start by making lots of mistakes, and eventually, it stops making mistakes. But when? Who knows? Okay, you don't know when it stops making mistakes, but eventually it will. That's all you know. That's all you get. So you can see this is a lot weaker than P. Okay? So the whole trick is to somehow 
play around between P and eventually P. So P is hard to implement, but it's very easy to write algorithms for P. But eventually P is very easy to implement. Uh, you can do it on the internet, but it's very hard to write algorithms for this one. But this is the important one, okay? So a lot of the course is going to be playing around between P and eventually P. Okay? Okay, so let's say a little how these things are implemented. So it's very intuitive. Huh? So the two nodes, you have two nodes, they exchange heartbeat messages. That means a heartbeat is just a message that is repeated like a heartbeat. Huh? Every 10 milliseconds, whatever, it sends a message. And it gets a reply. Boom, 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 like that. Okay? And the timing is measured. And you can measure the worst case round trip. Okay? And then, intuitively, it's very easy. If the, the message, the return message, times out and you don't get it, then you can suspect the node. Maybe he's dead, okay? But maybe it's okay. Maybe it's just the time is a little bit longer. <laughs> so if later you get a message again from the suspected node, then you restore. You revise the suspicion and you increase the timeout, okay? So this is typically an intuition on how the eventually perfect ones are implemented. I'll give you code later, but this gives you intuition. And this is all inside the box, okay? Inside the yellow box. So the user of the box does not see this. Nobody sees this. And you can try to be very smart here, right? Huh? Nowadays, people would say, let's use machine learning in here, okay? <coughs> Fine. Uh, to say sometimes to learn about what the, what the distributions are, the round trip, to make less mistakes. So you can try to be very smart in this box to make less mistakes, but you cannot get rid of the mistakes always. That's fundamental. You're in still a partially synchronous system. No matter how smart you are, you will always sometimes make mistakes. Okay? Okay, so that's the, the idea. Now we have to make a more formal, precise definition. Okay? I've given you lots of intuition, but we have to be precise. So there's two kinds of requirements for a failure detector. There's what's called completeness requirement, and the other one is accuracy. Okay? And you'll see this fits very well with our liveness and safety ideas. Huh? Completeness means if a node actually crashes, do we see it? Do we see all the actually crashed nodes or not? Uh, if we do, then we're complete. Okay, and the second one is accuracy, okay? This is about a live node. If I have a node that's alive, and I suspect that it crashed, but it's actually alive, then I make a mistake, yeah? that's a mistake. So accuracy is about not making mistakes, okay? About nodes, and completeness is about not missing something. So you see the two, the two different things, huh? Okay? So this should ring a bell. This is very similar to safety and liveness. In fact, we're making a definition of failure detector with safety and liveness. So of course, it's very trivial to do one or the other of them, huh? So for example, how can I satisfy number one? And I don't care about number two, but I can satisfy number one. What's the easiest way? Cold crash. Exactly. Just say everybody crashed, and then I'm complete. I'm not missing anybody. But of course, I'm not accurate. So how do I satisfy accuracy, but not complete? So I'm completely good here. No mistakes on the live notes. What's the easiest way? Nobody crashes. Nobody crashes, of course but uh, then you're missing number one. So it's very easy to have one or, well, one or the other. 
The problem is getting both, huh? Of course, in an asynchronous system, remember this is the extreme case, eh? You cannot get both of them. We cannot make a failure detector that uh, is complete and accurate. It's impossible in an asynchronous system. So we're very lucky that we don't have to worry about asynchronous systems, eh? We're very lucky that the internet is partially synchronous, huh? Okay, so we can extend our formal model. Remember the formal model with the state on the node and the out buff, in buff? So I'm just going to say we can extend it with failure detectors. So the idea is that we just add it. So what happens inside the box is magic, okay? The formal model doesn't care what happens inside the box. It only cares about the properties, huh? completeness or accuracy. So we can add failure detector state. We can have also, uh, in the transition function, we have this new state of the failure detector, okay? And then there's this failure detector function that magically will give us information as an oracle, okay? So in the formal model, this is very easy to add, huh? You just add this magic thing that tells you, gives you the information. So that's not the problem, okay? The problem is not the formal model. The problem is writing the algorithms with failure detectors, okay? So let me say now a little bit more about completeness and accuracy. So if you look at completeness, completeness and accuracy are actually pretty strong properties. So we actually define different versions of them. We have strong and weak <coughs> completeness, and we define strong and weak accuracy. And the reason is that it's not always possible to really do the best so we have these weaker versions. So the strong completeness, this is the one you want. Huh? Every crash node is eventually detected by all correct nodes. That means all correct nodes will detect all the crash nodes eventually. Okay? There exists a time after which all crash nodes are detected by all correct nodes. Okay, so this is the nice property of completeness, okay? So what do you think? Is this a realistic property or not? Now, now I want just to imagine, just, is this reasonable? Is this reasonable to, to demand this? In internet? Sorry? In internet? Uh, internet or wherever, yeah, internet. What do you think? How would you get to do this? Is, that re is this reasonable or does it smell very hard or what do you think? Think it's a reasonable property? Just let your intuition go. No. Why not? Because in internet, actually... Sorry? For example, in internet, if I want, I mean, to hold the nodes in internet... That means if a node crashes, if any, no any node crashes, then all of the correct nodes will eventually see that there is a problem with this node. Is that reasonable? What do you think? For internet, internet you have this thing called IP, you have routers. I don't know, what do you think? I mean, uh, there's really no right answer. I just want you to think a little bit here. Huh? So, so, well, how, do you, how would you go around detecting it? Well, if you send heartbeat to another, to a node, and no answer comes back. Uh, let's say the node actually does crash. You send a heartbeat, nothing comes back. But you can see that, right? That nothing comes back. So this actually is kind of, is fairly realistic, huh? For typical networks. It's not always realistic. Some networks, it's not, and I'll give you examples of that, okay? So here, all the nodes will see the crashes. 
That's reasonable if you have routers that connect everything, okay? If everything is connected to everything. But things are not always like that, huh? So there's some cases you don't get that, and you have weak completeness. Every crash node is eventually detected by some correct node. Some correct node. There is a privileged node that has a good view of the others. So my, my example of that is a football stadium, okay, with 100,000 spectators and 22 players in the middle. Each of those players can see all of the spectators, right? So if a spectator falls asleep, the player can look at the spectator with the binoculars and see that the guy is sleeping, right? So that means the players are like privileged and they can see all the nodes. But the spectators cannot see them each other, right? If I have a spectator here and another one is over there, 100 meters far away and he's asleep, I can't see that guy, okay? It's very hard. So that's kind of an example where you would have a weak completeness. Some nodes can see everything and some nodes cannot. Sometimes you have these nodes that are far away, okay? Internet of things on the edge and they have very poor connectivity. But they can all talk to the cloud, okay? So the cloud nodes have a very good view of them. But these Internet of Things nodes, they cannot really see each other. Huh? So this sometimes is useful. You see, some networks, you have privileged nodes. Sometimes. Still, we would like to have strong completeness when we can get it, huh? But you can't always get it. But this is actually also pretty good. The reason why this is pretty good is that those privileged nodes, they can actually tell the others what they see. Okay, so the two nodes on the edge, or the two players, the two spectators, if one of them is asleep, and the player sees that, uh, let's say, it's in, U it's in the United Kingdom, Prince Charles is watching the game, but he falls asleep. Oh, that's not very nice. So the player, he takes his megaphone and says to everybody, Prince Charles is asleep! So everybody knows it now, okay? So these privileged nodes, they can actually tell the others. So you can actually uh, take the weak completeness and kind of convert it with some effort into strong, okay? So, but sometimes the natural property is weak, okay? So I'm telling you, uh, because sometimes you have this. And in real networks, typically it's when you have nodes that are far away, okay? kind of in weak places. Okay, so you have strong and weak completeness. See the difference, huh? The weak, you have some privileged nodes. You can also have different kinds of accuracy. Okay? So for example, strong accuracy. No correct node is ever suspected by anybody. Okay? That means if a node does not crash, nobody will ever suspect it. P does not suspect Q unless Q has actually crashed. So there's no mistake, okay? So what do you think now of this one? Is this realistic? Is this a realistic property? So now we're kind of comparing to strong completeness. Huh? So strong completeness, you get, you're sure that you see the crash nodes. Or strong accuracy, you don't make mistakes on correct nodes. Huh? So is this one realistic? What do you think? No correct node is ever suspected. So if you make a mistake, yeah? If we have a maximum lifetime of the messages on the Internet. Right, so if you have some maximum delay, but you don't really know it, and the message is somehow slow, then you could suspect the node, even though it's correct. So this property is actually much harder to get huh, than the completeness, because it's not just the node that you're worried about, 
the message can have problems, okay? It can be slow. So this one is actually kind of hard to get, okay? And it's also why that there is uh, eventually perfect, huh? we know it's hard, we know. So mistakes will be made huh? with this one. So it's very hard, because the way to make it, so there's no mistakes, you have to make an extremely reliable and solid channel between all nodes that never has any problems. So that's very hard. Hard, when I say hard, I mean expensive. You can always do anything. Anything can be done. It's just that it gets very expensive. Okay? The problem is doing it in a reasonable cost. Okay? So this actually is a very strong assumption. Huh? If you really want to make this work, you need time out. I mean, you need bounds. You need bounds, synchrony. No premature timeouts. So that's very hard. So this is actually a hard property, yeah? This one is actually hard to get, huh? In real systems, okay? So there's a weaker version, okay? There exists a correct node that is never suspected. So, in fact, there is one node, let's say there's a node here that does not crash, and nobody will suspect it. Somehow, everybody can see that node. Again, it's like a privileged node, okay? Again, it's a node that can be seen by everybody. Uh, and uh, so if it crashes, everybody sees it. But if it doesn't crash, people will be sure it's not crashing. So this is actually also not so easy. So then I can give you an example using football, okay, which I like to use for examples. Again, you have a huge stadium, 100,000 spectators and 22 players in the middle, okay? So if a player falls down and starts sleeping, everybody will see that, okay? And they say, why are we paying this guy millions for sleeping in front of us, okay? So, so those players are actually privileged because everybody can see them, whereas the spectators are not <coughs> privileged. It's not true that everybody can see all the spectators, okay? So again, there's some privileged nodes. Maybe they have strong connections to everybody, uh, but the nodes don't have strong connection among themselves, but there's strong connection to everybody. So in human society, for example, um, Celebrities. People know always what celebrities are doing, yeah? but they don't know what you are doing. Yeah? So if, does that node still be correct all the time? Or may crash, but is never suspected to be crashed at the time? No. If it's correct, you will never falsely think it's crashed. If it crashes, then, then the accuracy doesn't, you can say it's crashing, okay? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's crashing, because then because uh, you will eventually not get messages. The problem is making a mistake when it's not crashing. That's the trick. If if it does not crash, then it's useful in my algorithm. So that's very important to know that. Okay. Whereas if it's crashed, it's not so critical because I will eventually know that. Okay. The problem is if it's correct, and I think it's crashed, that's very bad. Okay, so the accuracy is about that. It's about never making a mistake on correct nodes. Okay, the, the crash nodes, you will eventually... So, uh, the completeness in any case is eventually. If a node crashes, and if I don't think it's crashed now, you can say that's a mistake, right? But, but all information is eventual. So if a node crashes, I, and I don't know anything, but eventually I will know it crashes. But if a node is correct, and I think it's crashed, that's like a real mistake, okay? That's a real thing. I say it's crashed, but it's not crashed. So I'm actually doing a real mistake. So a node that is crashed, but I'm not saying anything, that's not really considered a mistake, because I'm not saying anything, okay? As long as I don't say anything, everything's fine, okay? It's when I say something, when I open my mouth, that, that I can make do something wrong. 
So accuracy, when I make a mistake, it means I say the node has crashed and it hasn't. But if I don't say anything, that's okay. No? Of course, I have to say things eventually. If the node crashes, I will eventually say it's crashed. That's the completeness property, okay? But not right away. We know it's going to take time. But when I do say something, it has to be correct. That's the point. When I say the note, I only say the note is crashed when it's really crashed, okay? When I, when I open my mouth, that's when you have to be careful, okay? When I stay silent, it doesn't really matter, okay? So weak accuracy, you can consider to be the players. There are notes that are always seen, okay, by everybody. So those could be like the football players in the stadium. Okay, so those are the kind of uh, properties that we're worrying about. Now, uh, a small subtlety, completeness is always eventual, okay? It's always, I will eventually see the crash notes, okay? But accuracy, the way I said it before, was not eventual. Huh? If I say weak accuracy and I say the node has crashed and it's wrong, then it's then the property is broken. Okay. But I can make the accuracy also eventual. What that means is that I'm actually allowed to make mistakes now. I'm allowed to make mistakes for finite time. So eventual means that after some time, it will be strong accuracy, but not now, okay? Not now, but later. Or after some time, it'll be weak accuracy, but not now, not yet. So after some finite time, the detector provides weak accuracy. So when I say eventual accuracy, it means I'm allowed to make mistakes. Not a problem. The property is still satisfied as long as the mistake making only is finite. Okay. After some time, I will not make mistakes. But prior to that, I can do any mistakes, any behavior. Okay? So this is actually a pretty weak assumption because you don't really know what the time is, huh? You don't know what this time is, any finite time could be years, okay? So these are actually kind of weak assumptions. Well, yeah, they are, but in some sense, it's all you can do, okay? Uh, when can eventual weak accuracy be achieved? Well, in a partially synchronous system, you can do that, because eventually, eventually, there will be bounds, and once there are bounds, you can detect failure with no mistakes, huh? once you have bounds. So, so when can eventual weak accuracy be achieved? In a partially synchronous system. You can do that. Okay? So this is the kind of thing we're going to be worrying about. Okay. So now, now I've given you kind of the whole overview. I, have totally confused you, maybe. I hope not that much, a little bit. So now I kind of make a summary. So here is synchronous systems, and here is partially synchronous systems. So we don't worry about asynchronous systems, huh? Oof, terrible things. We're not going to worry about those. You have synchronous and partially synchronous. So in a synchronous system, you have the bounds, so the perfect detector is the best one. We want that one. We like that one. Of course, hard to implement sometimes. So this one has strong accuracy. Okay? That means that uh, nobody ever makes any mistakes. Okay? But sometimes you have only weak accuracy. Okay? Sometimes you have weak accuracy. Uh, like some, uh, you're allowed to make mistakes with respect to some notes, but not with respect to all. Some notes are privileged. So this, <coughs> this detector also has a name, okay? 
So these are kind of the names that people gave. So the P is the perfect detector. The one that's weak is called strong. Okay, I'm sorry about that. The weak accuracy is actually called the strong detector S. So when we pe talk, people talk about a strong detector, it means the detector has weak accuracy. So I'm sorry about that. I didn't. This is for historical reasons. This comes from the 1990s when people were doing, when it was all a mess. So there's still some traces of the mess that you can see here. Huh? So a detector with weak accuracy is called a strong detector. But a detector with strong accuracy is called perfect. So this is the, this is actually the strongest one. Huh? The perfect one is actually stronger than the strong. Huh? Okay, so sorry about that, but uh, that's what it's like. And then when you move to partially synchronous systems, what happens is that everything stays the same except you add a little word, a little, little, uh, little uh, adjective here. Eventually perfect or eventually strong. So everything is the same except that you have eventual strong accuracy and eventual weak accuracy. That means it's allowed to make mistakes for a finite time, and then it stops making mistakes. So this is the partially synchronous, okay? So the one that we're going to be most interested in are P and eventually P, yeah? Like I said before, but sometimes you want these two guys, strong and eventually strong, when you have privileged nodes. Sometimes, sometimes these two are still <coughs> appearing, okay? So these are the main detectors. So when you define an algorithm, a distributed algorithm, you have to say which detector it works with, okay? Because changing, you might have a totally different algorithm in this, using this uh, detector or using this one. Huh? So usually the P algorithms are really simple. And the eventually P algorithms are much more complicated, okay? But they exist. So the nice thing is that these algorithms exist, whereas in the asynchronous system, you don't even have any, okay? So those are the main ones, but out of these four, the most important are P and eventually P, okay? So those are the ones you really have to get in your head, huh? Everything is built on top of that in distributed systems, okay? Uh, you will not see that in Google or Facebook or whatever, advertisements or papers, but everything is built on top of these two. And if people, if, you, if they don't say anything, then you have to assume it's using eventually P. If it's using P, they will say it. If there's a bounce, they will say it. Huh? Okay, so those are the main detectors. And then I have to say there's a little bit more... Uh, junk coming from the 1990s. <laughs> so this I do not expect you to learn. They have, we now have detectors with weak completeness. Okay, so they're all weak, they're weaker. They don't even detect all crash nodes. So we have detector Q, detector W, so this one is actually weak. Detector eventually Q and detector eventually W. So these were all invented in the 1990s, okay? So, you may rarely run into these when you have a system that's weakly complete, but, but you don't have to know that, okay? Okay, now I want to show you the formal, the definition, the specification when you write programs, okay, with these guys. So this one is the P, perfect failure detector, the module. It has one indication. Crash P, PI, notifies that PI is crashed. That's all. You, you don't send any messages into it. Eh? It only sends messages out. And it has two properties. <coughs> strong completeness and strong accuracy. Okay? Which are as follows. So now I'm defining it the way I defined last week. Eh? Strong completeness, eventually, every node that crashes is permanently detected by every correct node. Okay, and strong accuracy, if a node is detected, that means a crash message has been sent, then it has crashed. 
So no mistakes here. Huh? Okay. And now I want to play the safety liveness game again. So, so PFD1, is that safety or liveness? All properties. In a nice specification, they're all going to be either safety or liveness. Huh? Usually I won't combine them. So PFD1, safety or liveness? Sorry? Thank liveness, you. why? Why liveness? Sure? You sure about that? Are you sure? Who said liveness? Are you sure about that? Not anymore. Why not? You're right. It's not because I pretend to be doubting that you're wrong. Huh? Yeah, that's liveness, right? Why is it liveness? It cannot be broken. You cannot break it in finite time, okay? It's permanently detected. So, and the only way that you <coughs> break it is through infinite. If over the whole execution you never detect the crash node, then you've broken it. That's a typical liveness property, huh? So this thing is a good thing. You actually detect the crash node. It's a good thing that happens. So this liveness, eh? so what about this one? Probably it's going to be safety, right? Because you need usually you need both. Huh? So what do you think? Is this safety? And why is it safety? It's not enough to say safety. You have to tell me why. Okay, so say it's safety. Why is it safety? You tell me. Why is it safety? No? Can be broken. Can be broken. So how would you break it? How could you break this one? How could you detect a correct node? That's correct. You detect a node, but it has not crashed. So the crash message comes out on P2, but P2 has not crashed. That's it. It's broken. Huh? So you can break this. So this is safety. Yeah? So we have aliveness and safety. So you see, this is nothing magic. Yeah? So we have aliveness and a safety property. Yeah? And it's very easy to implement P in a synchronous system. Those systems are so nice. So any system that sits on a desk is going to be synchronous. Huh? Or that is in a small room, a cluster, or whatever, it will be synchronous. Huh? So there's a maximum transmission delay. Let's say it's between 0 and delta seconds. Okay? And so here's how you do it. Every node, every gamma, so it repeats, every gamma seconds, it sends a heartbeat message, okay? And every node also waits. Once it sends the message, gamma plus delta units, and if it does not get a heartbeat from PI, then it's, you're sure that PI has crashed, huh? Right? Uh -huh. So that's, uh, you can prove the two properties, huh? So strong completeness is easy to prove. A crashed node will not send heartbeats, okay? Eventually, every node will notice that there's no heartbeats. Fine, we have this one. What about accuracy? Okay, so assuming local computation is legible, negligible. If it's not, then you have to add a little bit of time. Huh? So the maximum time between two heartbeats is what? So I'm sending them every gamma, and the delay is between zero and delta. So the maximum time is when this one is as fast as possible and the next one is as slow as possible. Huh? So the maximum delay between two heartbeats is gamma plus delta, right? Uh, the first one is as fast, so it cannot be more because this one is as fast as it can go and this one is as slow as it can go. Okay? So if you do not get a heartbeat, in gamma plus delta, then you are absolutely sure that the node has crashed, huh? Because of the upper bound, messages are not lost here, huh? This is a synchronous system, huh? Okay? So there is never a mistake here, huh? So you can prove this is good, huh? Okay? So that, so the P is very easy. Okay? Let's now go to the eventually P one, okay, the eventually P, which is a little bit trickier, but not that much, but a little bit, 
virtually perfect. Here we have two indications, suspect P and restore P. So they're both messages coming out. Huh? So again, there's no messages going in in this box. Huh? So P is suspected to have crashed. And restore P means P is not suspected anymore. Now we think it's good again. Okay? So the two properties are strong completeness and eventual strong accuracy. Eventually, no correct node is suspected by any correct node. Okay? So that means it's allowed to make mistakes for a finite time. But after that, it should be like P. So that means it has a, a grace period. Huh? It's allowed for a certain time to be completely stupid, but after that time it has to be smart. Okay? So how do we implement this one? Okay, now this is interesting because now we're going to make the connection with the definition of partially synchronous, which was kind of vague, huh? which was kind of uh, tricky. Huh? Eventually there are bounds, but you don't know when, and you don't know what they are. Okay? But you know that after some finite times, some bounds will exist, even though you don't know what they are, and you don't know what the finite time is. So that's partially synchronous. So how do we make a detector for that? Actually, it's not that hard. So again, each node will send heartbeat, okay? Every gamma unit, tong, tong, tong. And each node will also wait. But now it's not a fixed time. We have some T, and we'll see this T is important, right? It waits a certain time. If it did not get a heartbeat from PI in this time, it says, suspect, ooh, the node maybe is crashed. Put P in a suspected set, okay? But also give the indication. So that's a local variable, huh? And so it suspects the node, okay? So that's the thing. But why does it need this set? Well, because maybe later on, it does get the heartbeat from PI. Eventually, the, so the heartbeat will arrive, but it's a little slower. So if it does get the heartbeat, and P is in the suspected set, ah, then P is okay. So re indicate restore, and remove from the suspected set. And now the thing is, we increase this time up T. That means the next time we do a heartbeat, we're going to wait longer, okay? So how much do you increase it? Well, there's different ways. You can add a time or you can multiply by some time. But you have to, this increase has to be always, uh, there, there, there should be no upper bound on how big T can get. Huh? It should be always getting bigger and the limit of this should be infinity, okay? It's not like Zeno where you're, you're it's always going to be getting closer to some maximum. No, T will always be increasing some amount towards infinity. Yeah? So now it's interesting to prove the correctness of this. Okay, so this is important because now we're going to connect this to the definition. So this is actually interesting because this will give you some intuition on that, this funny definition, okay? Okay, so let's make proof. Okay, so strong completeness is easy, huh? The, a crash node sends no heartbeats, you receive no heartbeats, fine, I think it's crashed. The trick is this one, huh? So let's say the node is inaccurately suspected. Okay, so P, so Q is correct, and Q thinks that P has crashed. So what we see is that the timeout will be increased. Okay, uh, Q will actually get the heartbeat and it will increase T. And now two things are going to happen. Two things. First of all, eventually the system becomes synchronous. And the second thing, it, T will become bigger than the unknown bound. Uh, so there's this unknown travel time. Huh? 
delta. It's actually bigger than gamma plus delta, because gamma is the heartbeat time. Huh? You see that these two conditions here. Huh? So we know the system is eventually going to become synchronous. So the more, the longer you run it, at some point it's going to become synchronous. Okay, fine. And the second condition is T will get bigger and bigger. As long as we inaccurately suspect T is going to get bigger and bigger. Huh? And eventually it's going to be bigger. So when, assume now the system has become synchronous and T is still getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually it will actually be bigger than delta, bigger than gamma plus delta. Huh? And now we're fine. At this point, there will be no more mistakes. You see that? So even though we don't know when it becomes synchronous, and we don't know what is this bound, we still know that after some time, Q will no longer make mistakes. You see that? We don't have to know the value of delta, and we don't have to know when it becomes synchronous. You see the reasoning here? It's a little bit subtle. You have these two conditions. Huh? So this is telling me that I can actually implement an eventually perfect failure detector. It's actually very practical, even with this funny definition of partially synchronous, huh? which is kind of a, a definition, a balancing act of ambiguity or something. Huh? Even with that funny definition, I can do a practical implementation of eventually perfect. So I can prove this is actually going to be exactly satisfying that property. You see that? So that means this kind of confirms, it kind of confirms that eventually uh, that partial synchrony is a good idea, huh? Because we can actually practically implement these eventually perfect failure detectors. You see that? It's important. It seems very simple, huh? So this line is important, huh? You have these two conditions, huh? You see that? I hope many of you are seeing it, huh? or you will see it. So why are we, uh, we are satisfying these two conditions, and even without knowing when it becomes synchronous or what the bound is, we still have an eventually perfect failure detector, okay? See that? Okay, so that's good, huh? Yes? We can, and with that, and now we can build all kinds of beautiful algorithms, of course, huh? on that, which we will do. Huh? Okay, let me make a small break now, and then we start making algorithms. And the first algorithm I want to do is called leader election, but we'll do it after the break. Okay. Talk about. Let me do and show you an example of an algorithm, but we're also going to do what I call specification engineering. We're going to tweak the specification so that the algorithm does exactly what we want. Okay? And, and there's going to be some connection between leader election and failure detectors. So this is kind of, so I'm doing this to give you some experience in thinking about failure detector, but also in specification engineering. So this is actually very important when you define the specification with the properties, that sometimes you want to change them a little bit, tweak them, to make things nicer, okay? So we're going to do a little bit of that, okay? So I'm going to show now leader election. So what is leader election? Leader election, intuitively, it's very simple. I have n nodes, and one of them is the is supposed to be the leader, is the boss, is the one that I elect as the leader, okay? But all the nodes have to elect the same one. And maybe nodes can crash, of course, huh? That's where the failure part comes in. So, so leader election is kind of intuitively a little bit like failure detector, huh? So the, the failure detector says whether a node has crashed. Huh? And the leader election, it, it is also a box with a message coming out. It says PI is the leader. Okay? And then and these P's, these nodes have some property, okay? 
So in a failure detector, they should all be failed nodes, huh? But in a leader election, we actually want to detect the correct node, but which is the same for everybody, okay? So I'm just giving some intuition here, huh? Which is gonna help us when we wanna specify this. Uh, so leader election, kind of intuitively, is similar to a failure detector, huh? When I say similar, I mean a box with things coming out with certain properties, huh? So in a leader election, I want to, all the nodes to elect the same leader. So that means every node has to come up with one node, which is the leader. So it suspects all nodes. That means it suspects all of them to be non, not leaders, okay? And one of them is going to be the leader. And then there has to be some property. They all have to pick the same leader, okay? So we're going to make some uh, specification of that, and then we'll write the code. And it's actually going to be kind of connected to, to P. So this is a, just to show you an example, yeah? Does the leader know he is the leader? Sorry? Does the leader know he is the leader? Or not? Yes, all the nodes. If the leader is the leader, then he will know he's the leader, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all the correct nodes will say there's a leader, and there might be crash nodes, huh? And they all have to think that the same node is leader, huh? So the leader will know that he's a leader, of course, huh? So we're going to define two algorithms. So leader election, which is kind of like P, and then another one called eventual leader election, which is kind of like eventual P. So eventual leader election, is written like this with some big omega, okay, capital omega. Why is that? Again, this is all shrapnel coming from the 1990s. Huh? So in those days it was called, this was called <coughs> omega, but it will be somehow similar to eventually P. So I hope that this will give you some, maybe, hopefully, some better intuition on how you use these things and how you make algorithms, okay? So we're going to find two algorithms, but I'm going to start with this one, leader election, okay? So I start with P. So the perfect failure detector, it always eventually detects failures, so strong completeness, and it never suspects correct nodes, strong accuracy, so that's P, okay? Now, LE is in some sense similar, okay? Uh, so it's complete also. Eventually, every correct node will pick some leader, some correct node, which is the leader, okay? So this is like a strong completeness. So if the node, <coughs> so if the, the leader is crashed, it will pick somebody else, huh? So it will ditch crash leaders, but it will eventually end up with some correct node, okay? So that's a completeness property, yeah? A completeness property that it will trust some correct node, okay? And leader election also has an accuracy uh, property. All the nodes have to pick the same leader, of course, huh? If I have 100 nodes and, and five of them crash, the 95, the, all of the remaining ones have to pick one of them, one of those 95, huh? So formally, no two correct nodes, I say trust different correct nodes, so they will pick different leaders, huh? Uh, so informally, uh, never ditch a correct leader. That means once you pick a correct leader, then you will not change that and pick the wrong one, okay? So this is an accuracy property, yeah? Because you can break this if you have two correct nodes trusting different leaders, huh? Okay, so that's accuracy. So I don't want to go too much in detail, but it's an accuracy property, yeah? Huh? So if two nodes do trust different correct nodes, 
then then that doesn't that doesn't that can't work. One of them has to has to switch. So that that's breaking. It's not allowed to switch. Okay. So that that means the system is broken. Okay. So that's an accuracy property. So here are the properties. Of now, so so basically we inspired ourselves kind of from P and we came up with these two properties. So the first one is eventually every correct node <laughs> trusts some correct node. A trust means it's the leader, huh? And it's accurate. No two correct nodes trust different correct nodes. So they all would pick the same leader. So these are the two properties that we can come up with for leader election. You see, that's reasonable, right? These two are reasonable, huh? So you, every node will pick a leader, and the nodes will never pick different leaders. That's reasonable, huh? But now, but now let me do some specification engineering. Okay, so these properties are fine, okay? In some sense, they're okay. But assuming those two, this will give you behaviors that are maybe a little bit non-intuitive. So here's an example with three nodes. So P1 elects P3, P2 elects P3, P3 elects P3, and then crashes. Boom. Okay, so P1 will see that P3 has crashed. It will elect somebody else, P1, for example. P2 is very slow here. Huh? It's okay, it's allowed to be slow. But in the meantime, P2 has actually elected uh, a crash node. P3 is crashed, huh? That means P1 is allowed to change nodes. You see that? No two correct nodes trust different correct nodes. But P2 is not trusting a correct node. P2 is, is picking a failed node. That means this thing is always true. There's no, th this condition is always true. That means P1 can flip back and forth. P1 P2, P1, flip, 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 until P2 chooses, P1 is allowed to flip here. You see that? So that's a perfectly reasonable behavior with this specification, right? So specification is always a little bit subtle, huh? So if I assume this specification, which seems reasonable, huh, then I get this behavior. But until P1 and P2 both detect the crash, then f kind of funny things can happen. Huh? But maybe you say that's okay, I don't mind, because as soon as P2 sees that P3 has crashed, it will change, and it maybe will pick P1, and then P1 will pick P1, and we're done. Okay, so that's fine. So, uh, so this, this flipping, maybe you accept that, okay? Because it's valid, it's part of the specification. But maybe you don't like that. Maybe you want to tweak the specification so that the nodes will not be flipping around like this, okay? Uh, so here, P1 is leaving, you can say it's leaving a correct leader. It elects P1, but P1 is correct. But according to this specification, it's allowed to change. See that? It's allowed to do P2. Why is it allowed? Well, because the second condition is always vacuously true. Huh? Because there are no two correct nodes trusting different correct nodes. Because P2 is correct, but it's trusting a, a crash node here, huh? temporarily. Huh? So this is always true here. So P1 is allowed to flip back and forth. Okay. So, so when you make your first specification, sometimes uh, it's not exactly what you want, and it can be doing kind of little bit weird things. Huh? Specifications are actually hard, usually. They're very short, very compact, but the effects can sometimes be hard, okay? So let's say we don't like this. We don't like this 
when, when P1 is switching between P1 and P2 and P1, all of these are correct. Why is P1 changing when all these nodes are correct? Why doesn't it pick a node and just stay with that node? Okay. So the, the thing is, let's, let's tweak the specification now to make it more according to what the intuition wants. Okay. So you see what I'm doing? You see what I'm doing here, huh? I don't have to do that, huh? huh? But I, I do that here because I don't like this behavior, okay? So when you build real systems, you'll get that kind of situation sometimes, huh? So specifications are very subtle, is kind of the point. So I'm going to remove this possibility. I'm going to say, I don't want P1 to be flipping back and forth. So I'm going to add a third property, okay? So those previous was two properties, but I'm going to add a third one. I don't want P1 to start flipping. So let me add here a third one. So which one do I add? Well, there's, it's not that easy. There's no recipe for that. Here, for example, you could say, if a node is elected leader by PI, all previously elected leaders by PI have crashed. Okay? That means PI can only change leaders if the one that it has has actually crashed. Otherwise, it's not allowed to change. Okay? So we can add that property. So if we add that, then we can see here, P1 elects P3, P3 crashes. Okay, P1 will now elect P1, for example because of this crash. But now it's not allowed to change anymore because P1 has not crashed. Huh? That's itself, of course. Huh? P1 has not crashed, so it's not allowed to change. So this is not allowed anymore. Okay? That means there will be no more dithering back and forth. Okay? So adding this third property actually makes the algorithm more stable in a sense. It's going to be less, it might be doing less flipping back and forth. Okay. So this gives us our interface and then we can write the code. So now we're going to do the interface. So we have leader election. So there's one indication, LE leader, uh, leader election leader. So there's a leader message coming out and there's three properties. So the eventual completeness, which is kind of like the failure detection property, yeah? and then the agreement, which is like the no mistake property, no two correct nodes trust different correct nodes, and then this third one, and we add it, we've added it just so that it's more stable. If a node is elected leader, all previously elected leaders have crashed. Okay. And now we can write the code. So let's assume something to make the code simple. So I'm going to implement it now. So let's assume something. So let's assume that the nodes are somehow ranked, okay? Each node has like a, a, a MAC ID or something, some number attached to it, that it's ordered, okay? So that's something we can assume because rail systems will be like that, okay? So we can assume the nodes are somehow ranked. Uh, and then we assume that there's this function, R, the ranking function, and it will tell me what are the higher ranked nodes. So P1 has the highest ranking. So R of P1 is empty set. So P2 is the second one. So R of P2 has a set of P1. And R of P3 is P1 and P2. So these are all the higher ranked nodes. <coughs> and R of P4 is P1, P2, P3. <coughs> So this ranking function, we assume it exists. Okay, now you can say, that's weird, why are you were assuming this? Well, we are writing pseudocode here, okay? And the advantage of writing pseudocode is that I can invent variables and data structures, any ones that I think I, I will need, okay? So this function is nice. Uh, if I really want to implement it, of course, I have to choose data structures, whatever. I don't care, this is pseudocode, okay? 
And I'm assuming they're ranked like this, so the ranking function is like this. Why do I write it like this? Why don't I just have like an order? Uh, R of P1 greater than R of P2. Well, if I do it like this, you'll see the code is very simple. I really, really want simple code, okay? So I'm going to pick my data structures so that the code is simple, okay? So if you think this is weird, you're right, it is kind of weird, but if I, if, I do, if I do this, then I can make really simple code. It's just one, it's just a few lines of code, the whole algorithm, okay? And it works both concurrently and when there's failures. It works with failures. So that's not bad, huh? So I'm assuming that, okay? Yeah? What, what is the run based on? Oh, it depends on, it based on anything. And I'm just assuming that the nodes have some ranking. In the real world, it could be the IP address, or a MAC address, or some <coughs> number that you give when you... It could be a timestamp, which is an integer, and they're all ordered, of course. So it could be whatever, but assuming this will make the code very simple. Huh? If, I, if I don't have this ranking, it gets much harder to, to do leader elections. So this is something I'm going to do a lot. Huh? in this course. I'm going to assume certain kinds of data structures that are reasonable, and when you assume them, the code is very simple. So the justification for this is that the code is simple, huh? and, and that real systems can, can give you that. Huh? Okay. So this is just to convince you that I'm not being totally arbitrary and weird here. Huh? I'm actually being reasonable, because the goal is simple code, huh? and you will see, the algorithms will get complicated. So anything you can do to make the code simple is good. Huh? Okay. So here is the code. That's the whole algorithm. This, that, that's it. It's just a few lines. So you see it's not very complicated. Okay. So here's my... Uh, leader election, so it uses by a perfect failure detector. Right? Clearly, it's based on perfect failure detector. So my leader election algorithm will be built on top of a perfect failure detector. Huh? Clearly, yeah? So here's how it works. So when it starts up, there's an init event. There's also crash events coming from the, the leader. The, the perfect failure vector underneath. And then there's this third rule, which has a Boolean condition. So the upon event, it's not just messages you can put here. You can also put Boolean conditions. And when this, when this condition is true, the, the rule can be triggered, can be run. Okay. So here's how it works. So the init event, so I have a suspected set which is a set, starts being empty set, and I have a local variable which is saying which is the leader. So far it's the highest one, okay? Assume I have this highest <laughs> function of R. Remember I have my function R. And now a crash comes. The crash is very easy. All I do is I add PI to the suspected set. Very simple. So how am I actually computing a leader here? Well, all of the smartness is in this Boolean condition, okay? If there exists a PI such that R of PI is a subset of suspected <coughs> and PI is not an element of suspected, then PI becomes a leader. What that means is that if there's a no PI such that all higher ranked nodes are crashed, that's what this means, huh? I read it like this. If there exists a PI such that all higher rank nodes are crashed and PI is not crashed, or I don't know it to be crashed, then PI is the new leader. And I'm sending the message up, leader. PI is the leader. Okay? So as soon as I know all of the nodes, as soon as all the crash events arrive and the algorithm finishes, I will, all the nodes will have the same leader. Because all the nodes, because the failure detector is perfect, 
all the nodes will have the same suspected set uh, when they get the crash messages up, uh, which they will because of the strong completeness property of P. Okay, that means this condition will give the same PI for all nodes. Okay, you see that? So this is very simple code, huh? So why is it simple? It's simple because of the way I pick R. It's simple because the condition of the upon can be a Boolean condition, and, the no and this rule becomes runnable when the Boolean condition is true. And this is an exists, which means it's actually looking for a PI. Does there exist a PI such that this is true? So this is actually very powerful pseudocode. Huh? Implementing this, this is actually already a loop. Huh? This is a while loop already. Huh? And this, at the, every time you change the local state, you have to recheck this node, huh? this condition. Huh? You see that? So in fact, this pseudocode is very powerful. Huh? Huh? It would be nice to have languages that you could do just like that. Huh? So that's it. That's the whole code for the leader election. So what do you think of that code? It's nice? Do you like it? We're going to see lots of code, but this is already a non-trivial algorithm. Huh? All the nodes will pick the same leader, and it's basing itself on the perfect failure detector, huh? because they will all have to see the, all the crashes, so it's strong completeness. So they will all eventually see all the crashes, no mistakes, so that this will actually give them the same leader, all of them. Huh? And it only changes leaders if the previous one has crashed. So this also satisfies that local property where you're not allowed to dither back and forth. Huh? What do you think of that? Oh, now I've, I've made you, I've silenced everybody. No, it's not too complicated, right? Come on. Tell me it's not too complicated. It's nice code, right? I would love to have languages to let me write this code. Huh? Actually, there has been some work, but it's mostly on the level of PhD thesis, of building languages that look like that. Because no languages for making distributed systems are actually looking like this, even though this is like the best one. Huh? Okay. Probably you will not see much simpler code than this. Huh? You see that? <laughs> what do you think of that? Nice, no? Okay. I'm assuming that you agree with me that it's nice. Okay, so that's that's leader election. Now, now let me do eventual leader election. Uh -huh, the omega. So, eventual leader election means that I'm allowed to make mistakes. I'm allowed to pick wrong leaders because I incorrectly suspect nodes. So eventual leader election, which is the omega, it's based on it's based on eventually p. Okay. Well, the omega here. And this is the p. So I'm going to weaken leader election to omega. Eventual agreement, so I'm going to be using eventually uh, P. Now uh, I cannot use this trick anymore because now there can be mistakes all the time. So now there's no issue of dithering. Now the, the, perf the failure detector is allowed to make mistakes. And that means this property, no two correct nodes will trust different correct nodes. It now becomes eventual. So that means the leader election is kind of behaving in the same way as eventually P. That means it's allowed to pick bad leaders in the beginning, but eventually it will pick a good leader. Huh? This becomes eventual. So you can say, yeah, that's kind of weak. Yeah, the weakness of eventually P kind of propagates up to Oh my God. So the, this is the specification now. 
Again, you have one message coming out. Huh? This is the leader. And you have these two properties. Eventually, every correct node trusts some correct node. That means every node picks a leader. And the second one, eventually, no two correct nodes trust different correct nodes. But in the beginning, they're allowed to. Okay? Because we have eventually there. Okay? <coughs> okay? <coughs> okay, we can write the code directly from eventually P. Okay? We will trust the node for the highest ID, the highest rank, among all nodes not suspected by eventually P. So this can be a mistake. Huh? This can actually give a mistake at the beginning. Huh? So here's the code. So it's almost the same as before. It's very simple. So the main difference is that instead of one crash here, you have two events. Suspect will add P to the suspect list and your store will remove it. So the suspect list can fluctuate. Huh? In the beginning, you're allowed to make a lot of mistakes. So this algorithm is not really very nice, in a sense, huh? because in the beginning, it can be really wrong. Huh? But the code is simple. Well, that's at least one advantage. So the code is almost the same. So we find it exists a PI such that all higher rank nodes are suspected. Do, are they really crashed? Maybe not, but they're all suspected. And PI is not suspected. That's the current leader. So this might not be right huh, in the beginning, because I might be suspecting wrong nodes. But eventually, it will be right. Okay. So this algorithm does eventual leader election, but it's not really a very nice <coughs> algorithm in a sense, huh? Because, because all the badness of eventually P, I still see it here, huh? <laughs> So this is not our best example of, a, of, a, of an algorithm using eventually P, huh? You can see that, huh? Because the leader I'm electing, in the beginning, it could be totally wrong leader, huh? Okay? But this, is, but this example I'm just showing to you to give you a first example of an algorithm. Huh? So we're going to see better algorithms. Okay. Now I want to do one more thing with leader election. I want to look at crash recovery. Huh? So crash recovery, this is for, for distributed databases and so on. Huh? And this is actually important. Because in a distributed database, when you do a transaction, you have maybe seen already things like two-phase commit protocol. Does that say anything to you? How you implement transactions? No? Well, usually when you implement a transaction, one of the nodes will be like the transaction manager, and it will manage everything. So it's a kind of leader in a sense. Huh? And that's the one that organizes the transaction. So this kind of algorithm can be useful for distributed transactions. So let's see, what about crash recovery? So remember how crash recovery works? So in crash recovery, a node can crash, but then it can come back. But it maybe has forgotten part of its state, okay? It comes back, okay? But it might have forgotten, but it remembers some of the state. So it's like a, a database, huh? The RAM disappears, but the content of the disk <coughs> is the same. The stable storage, it remains. Huh? So uh, remember, crash recovery, a node can crash and recover and still remember part of its state. Huh? But uh, it might crash and recover multiple times. Okay, remember, if it crash recovers infinitely often, <laughs> then it's unstable, then it's bad guy, bad. We don't want to elect that one, okay? We do not want to elect an unstable node that keeps crash recovering forever. It's not right, it's not a good node, okay? So how do you do that? Okay, we're going to extend our code 
with one other piece of information in the ranking. So a node can actually count the number of times it crashes. Whenever it recovers, it increments by one a number in the stable storage. Okay? And the number of times it's crashed is called the epoch. This is actually a well-known technique. Okay? Many systems use this kind of technique. Epoch or generation or something. Huh? So if it crashes once and recovers, then it's in the second epoch. And if it crashes again and recovers, it's epoch three and so on. Huh? And the idea is that you will elect the leader with the lowest epoch in the node ID. Okay? That means all the nodes will know the epoch of the leader. Okay? They will know the node, the, the epoch. So when the node does the when in the ranking function, there's the epoch we added in there. And that means once you start ranking the nodes, you favor the ones with low epoch numbers. And that means a node that crash recovers too much, the epoch number will grow forever, and we will not pick that one. Okay? So we will pick the node with the lowest epoch. Okay? So the code is almost the same as before. Okay? We, all we have to do is distribute the epoch number between the nodes. So we send the epoch number among the nodes. And we can, and the only thing that changes then is the ranking function, okay? So you can see this algorithm then is a small change from the previous one. We just add epoch, and it handles crash recovery, okay? So what do you think of that? So you see, we're now we're, we're starting to do kind of subtle reasoning, huh? Uh, so here I introduce crash recovery, and you have to understand exactly what it is to make to understand this algorithm. Okay. Okay. In the rest of the course, I'm not going to talk so much about crash recovery, but it's nice to talk about it once here, because in real systems, it does exist, and in databases, this epoch thing is used a lot. Huh? If you are going to do distributed databases, you're going to see this kind of idea bring, coming up. Okay? So with this, we can do actually a leader election. And once you do the leader election, you can actually do a transaction manager. And this works fine. Let's say I have five copies of a distributed database, and some of them are failing. Okay. The, whole, the problem is that some of them are failing, some of them crash forever, some of them recover, some of them don't recover, and it has to work. They all have to under, have the same leader with all of this weirdness. Okay. So with this algorithm, they will all eventually have the same leader, and then they can actually do the transaction. Then they will all have the same transaction manager, and they can do the transaction. Oof. All of that just to get a transaction done, huh? Okay. But usually they're not crashing, huh? But with this, we guarantee that when there is crashes, it will not go wrong, okay? So when you see this kind of algorithm with crashes, you might get the idea it's all this overhead, all this work for the extra crashes, but in the real, real life situation, crashes are very rare. Okay. They will not happen so often. So you will only put crashes, uh, you will only handle crashes like one out of a thousand or out of a million cycles. Huh? The trick is it has to be correct. When there's a crash, you don't want to break the system. So that's why these algorithms are important. Huh? Okay. So this is just to show you something about crash recovery. Okay. So that's all I want to say about leader election. Uh -huh. So it gives you some idea of uh, the kind of the way you think. Okay, you think it's not so easy, yeah? But we have these very concurrent fault-tolerant algorithms. So the code is still very simple, huh? right? Okay, so that's, that's all I want to say about leader election.
So next week I'm going to talk about broadcast. That's very down to earth. But I want to end by just a few things. I want to end with something a little bit mathematical. But I will not totally overload your brains, I hope, on this. Uh, because distributed systems, you have a lot of different algorithms, a lot of different models, uh, synchronous, partially synchronous, P, eventually P, S, eventually S. And so you want to compare them. So one of the things I want to mention right now, before I stop, is to introduce the notion of problem reduction. <laughs> So X and Y are algorithms, okay? We say X can be solved given a solution to Y, okay? So you could say LE can be solved given a solution to P. That means if I have the algorithm P, I can make the algorithm for LE, okay? Or omega can be solved given eventually P, okay? So x is reducible to y. Given a solution to y, I can solve x. So I'm comparing two algorithms here. Okay? Now this, this thing, it's not a partial order. It's something called a pre-order. So I don't know how much mathematician you are, but this is actually a very simple thing. So a pre-order has two properties. It's reflexive and it's transitive. That means x can be solved given x, and if x can be solved given y, and y can be solved given z, then x can be solved given z. Because that's easy, yeah? You use z to make y, and then you use y to make x. So this is not the same as a partial order, because in a partial order, you have if x is related to y and y to x, then x is equal to y. But we don't have that here, because we can have two problems that are just as hard, but they're not the same problem, okay? So it's not exactly, uh, it's not exactly um, a partial order, it's missing one thing. So it's reflexive, it's transitive, but it's not anti-symmetric. Uh, so reflexive means x can be solved given a solution to x. That's reasonable, huh? It's just the same algorithm. Transitive, so if x can be solved using y and y using z, then of course x can be solved using z. So you use the implementation of z to implement y, and then you use the implementation of y that you got to implement x. So it's transitive, but it's not anti-symmetric because you can have two different problems and each one of them can be used to implement the other one even though they're not the same. So remember, in the very first lecture we had total broadcast and consensus, which were equivalent. But they're not the same problem, huh? But they have the same power. You can use each one to implement the other. So. So you can actually, you cannot say, if this goes both directions, they're not actually the same, but they're equivalent. Huh? So we could say that if x can be solved using y, and y using x, then x is equivalent to y. But it's maybe not the same problem, but it's the same power. And if x is strictly weaker than y, Okay, that means x can be solved using y, but they're not equivalent. That means x is strictly weaker than y, okay? Because it doesn't go both ways. Okay, so we, we actually have some examples of that. So we say, for example, eventually p is reducible to p. That's easy, right? Given P, we can implement eventually P. That's completely trivial. We just return P suspicions, and it will always satisfy eventually P. It's actually a very good eventually P because it's not making any mistakes, okay? The eventually P we get from this will be one that's not making mistakes, but it's still 
Okay. 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 In the asynchronous model, eventually P is strictly weaker than P. Okay. We can use P to implement eventually P, but we cannot use eventually P to implement P. That's, that's reasonable. Huh? Eventually P <coughs> can make mistakes. And P does not make mistakes. There's no magic way to get rid of the mistakes. Okay? That's something you can prove. So there's no magic way given eventually P to implement P. There's no way we can get rid of it. Otherwise, life would be so great. But that's not possible. Okay? Okay? So we can actually make some kind of uh, reasoning on this. If x is reducible to y, and we know x is impossible to solve, then y is impossible too. Because otherwise, if it would not be impossible, you could use y to implement x. So if x is impossible, then y has to be impossible too. So we can use it to reason about problems. Huh? You see? So if eventually p reduces to p, and some problem can be solved with eventually p, it can also be solved with p. That's very intuitive, huh? If you can solve it with a detector that's allowed to make mistakes, then of course it will also work if the detector makes no mistakes, huh? Okay? So that's all uh, very important, useful, huh? Okay. Let me just say one or two more things, and then we're done for today. Something to, to meditate. OK. So let's say we use P to solve a problem. We have a perfect failure detector. But P is actually not very practical. It needs synchrony. P is hard to implement. Huh? So the question is, can we implement x with eventually p? Uh, but sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes a weaker failure detector than p will not solve x. So that's something we can reason about at the level of reductions. We don't have to reason about it using the, the code or anything like that. Huh? Uh, for example, Let's say x is solvable with p. Uh, can we solve x with a weaker failure detector, like eventually p? That's an important question. Or maybe it's impossible. If, okay, if, if eventually p is strictly weaker than x, then we cannot solve x, okay? Okay, so we can actually show that P is the weakest failure detector. That means you cannot go to eventually P. Yeah? If we can show that P is reducible to X, that means using X we can implement P. Then we know that P and X are equivalent. Okay? If we know this and we know this, then P and X are equivalent. Okay? So if we know this, then we know P is equivalent to X. But we also know that eventually P is strictly weaker than P. Okay? But since P is equivalent to X, that means we cannot solve X using eventually P, because otherwise you could do eventually you could use eventually P to solve P. Okay? So with this kind of reasoning, you can show that uh, you cannot use eventually P to solve X. Otherwise, X would be equivalent to eventually P, and, it would, and P would be equivalent to eventually P, which is not the case. Okay? So this kind of reasoning, we're going to be juggling problems around. Uh, P, eventually P. Can we do the algorithm in X with P with eventually P? So the way to write that down concisely is to use this kind of notation. Okay. Okay. So let me stop here for today.